Well, we are indeed so grateful that you're here today. Uh, if you haven't already been looking at your bulletin, I certainly want to encourage you to do so because there's lots of great information on the inside about upcoming opportunities for service and for spiritual growth. Uh, that's what we always want to provide because, of course, our mission here is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And so we always want to offer those uh, wonderful opportunities uh, to make that possible. So we're in the midst of this worship series called Selfie Less. And in part, of course, our goal has clearly been to try to discover what does it mean to live selflessly in the midst of a selfie kind of world where we're always kind of focused on self with those cameras, right? But really, both literally and figuratively, just kind of focused on self. And last week as we began, we kind of talked about how acts of service, living selflessly, start in the heart. And in part, what we uh, discovered last week was in order for that to start in the heart, We've got to start asking um, a different kind of question. Not so much what's in it for me or what can I get or what can I do, but rather, what would Jesus want? And if I were to respond to that question, what would Jesus want, then my heart begins to follow, right? Because Jesus is after our hearts and Jesus desires our hearts. And so last week it was all about um, service that starts out of the heart. Now this week we recognize that we can't just stay there. We know that it starts there. But now we have to act. We need to do something about our response to Jesus' call on our lives and our hearts to help alleviate suffering and to help do something about those who are suffering. And it got me to thinking about a concept that um, we've all been familiar with over the last couple of decades or so. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm too young to think back more than 10 years, right? So, no. Probably going back about 20 years, there was a concept that began in the corporate world, in the business world, and it was called outsourcing. You know outsourcing, right? Uh, if we can get it done cheaper, uh, perhaps quicker, maybe even better, we're going to outsource the personnel somewhere else. We might go overseas, we might go across the country, we might uh, outsource it somewhere. We're not going to pay for the labor, we're going to outsource it some other way, right? And we have kind of this uh, love-hate relationship with outsourcing, right? Uh, we know that it can save money, we know that it might help in the corporate world in terms of the bottom line, and sometimes that can be helpful, but if ever we've been impacted by outsourcing, uh, whether literally uh, we lost our job or perhaps we uh, have been on the other end of the phone line or perhaps even the computer line where uh, uh, services were outsourced, sometimes it was frustrating, right? So we kind of have this love-hate relationship with outsourcing and we tend to think of it only as a corporate or business concept. But the reality is, uh, if we think about it, we, we sometimes do it ourselves. Not all of us, but many of us. I mean, if we um, are kind of short on time, a little limited, and we might have a dollar or two extra that we have a little bit of discretion with, um, we might outsource mowing the lawn, right? Anybody outsource mowing the lawn? You don't need to raise your hand. No shame here, right? But we might outsource that because uh, we might can get it done quicker than if I did it, or easier, certainly, than if I did it, uh, and I'm not overly a a a averse to sort of shelling out a few dollars to have somebody do that, right? Or uh, if I'm short on time, uh, but I have a few extra dollars, I might outsource uh, the cleaning of my house. I, I don't really like cleaning my house. I don't do it very well. And so if I have a little extra money, I might consider outsourcing that particular service, right? So some of us outsource just in our own personal lives. And then it began to make me wonder sort of aloud. I wonder, I wonder if we don't do this sometimes in the nonprofit volunteer world, too. Um, we begin to recognize that I value things, but I also know I'm kind of short on time. And so I begin to wonder if I could, maybe somebody else could take care of that. Maybe somebody else could do that for me. Maybe somebody else would make this possible. So much so did I wonder about this. I, I began to remember that a few years ago there were a couple of... Um, surveys done about nonprofits and volunteerism. And, and you might be fascinated like I was to know the outcome of several of those surveys because there were two distinct outcomes from almost every one of these surveys. The first outcome was how much Americans in particular value volunteerism. We believe it's important. We want to serve. We want to make a difference. We want to be a part of something that uh, alleviates suffering or makes something happen, right? So as, as a people... 
the surveys indicated we value volunteerism. And, and wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, I, I think we could all agree that that's a good thing, right? That we value that. It was the second finding in several of these studies that was a little troubling and, and kind of flew in the face of this whole concept of, yeah, we value volunteerism, we value that concept, and it's this. The second result of almost all of the surveys was that volunteerism was on the decline. Well, that seems kind of weird. We, we value volunteerism. We value getting things done. We value making a difference. We, we want to do this, right? We value it. But the surveys indicated that we may think that we value it, but the reality is overall, and obviously this is a generalization, but overall, um, there's a big gap in what we actually do. And, and so the gap seems to be, I believe this is important, but man, my, my time is premium and, and limited, and, and I've got all kinds of obligations. I've got work obligations and family obligations and, and other kinds of personal obligations, and therefore I know that I want to do this and I know that it's the right thing to do, but I don't know how I'm going to fit it in, right? My hunch is there's quite a few of us in this room, myself included, who've run against that wall and, and kind of wondered, how am I going to get this done? I know that that needs to happen, and I know that I actually want to do that, and I clearly recognize it's a good thing to do, but I, I don't know. How am I going to squeeze it in, and how am I going to make all? How am I going to get all the blocks in just the right place? Right. Well, that's when I began to wonder about our church and the values that we hold. Uh, many of you know we have three simple, primary values. Things that we lift high and believe guide our every thought and help us emulate the way we believe a follower of Jesus ought to live. I'm going to share just two of those because they're tremendously relevant uh, to our time together today. So if you haven't already taken out your notes, whether on the app, on your phone, or in your worship bulletin, I want to encourage you to take out the worship notes that are there. And, and just write down real quickly these two values because they speak heavily into this concept that our service acts out of the heart. So the first value that we hold as a congregation is servant ministry. I mean, when all is said and done, Jesus was about serving others, right? He taught about it, he lived it, he professed it, he helped others understand that we are here to serve. He would literally say, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but rather to serve, right? And so uh, a foundational concept in all of Christianity, and certainly one that we hold high here at Treach, is servant ministry. And, and the second one is equally uh, uh, gifted about it and, and for which we uh, want to live, and that is that we cherish and live into radical love. Radical love. Not just, hey, I kind of like you and you're a good person, love, right? But, but radical love. And radical love is the love of Jesus because Jesus loved people that most others would, would never love, right? Jesus loved the woman who was about to be stoned to death because she'd been caught in adultery and the law told people to stone her to death. And Jesus loved her as she was. Jesus called a motley crew of 12 guys who were tax collectors and fishermen and sinners and all, one of them, you know, uh, betrayed Jesus. Uh, one could argue two of them did because Peter kind of was right there with Judas, right? But he called these guys and loved them just as they were. Jesus loved the lepers and he would touch them and he would embrace them. Jesus loved the woman who had a blood flow for 12 years that made her completely unclean. She couldn't worship. Uh, she couldn't have relations with other people. Uh, she was considered unclean and an outcast in society. But Jesus loved her. And that's radical because most other people would have shunned her. And, and so part of what we're called to is this radical love that says, I love you just as you are, and I'm going to love you into the kingdom, and I'm going to love you the way God loved me, even when I didn't deserve to be loved. And that's radical because not everybody is lovable, right? Right? Uh, maybe me, maybe you, maybe somebody we know, maybe somebody sitting next to you, I don't know. But uh, not everybody's lovable. But radical love says, I will love you because God first loved me, right? And so these become our values. They become foundational to who we are. And, and here's the tremendous truth about them. We cannot afford to outsource these values. We can't afford it. Because it's who we are. It's what we're about. It's foundational to who we are as followers of Jesus. So we cannot afford to say, somebody else will do that. 
I'll, I'll either pay them or hope for them or wish for them or, or point to them or guide them, but, but I'm going to outsource. We can't do that, friends. Not only because we value it as a congregation, but because it's a value of Jesus. In fact, if we were to outsource that, as your notes indicate, we really couldn't uh, consider ourselves Jesus' followers. It, it really wouldn't work that way. Uh, because Jesus radically loved people and he served people, and if we are his followers, then, then we uh, we got to do it, right? In fact, the other uh, silly uh, word I would say to you is, we can't really be treachers. Treachers is that phrase we call those of us who either attend or come or are members of this church. It used to be uh, decades ago we would call folks who came and showed up on Sunday morning treacher creatures. Anybody remember that? Long time ago? Yeah, treacher creatures, right? So uh, if indeed these are our values, radical love, servant ministry, and the third one, of course, is biblical relevance, that we hold God's word uh, with high regard and we live into it as best we can. We can't be followers of Jesus or treacher creatures unless we live into this. Jesus actually has a lot to say about this. In fact, what Jesus has to say about this has to do with a very serious and deep concept known as judgment. Did you know you were in a Methodist church and we're about to talk about judgment? Man. Pull up your pants and hold on. Because here we go. So in Matthew chapter 25... Jesus is about to end his earthly ministry. And in that ending, he wanted to call the disciples together as followers, and he wanted to give them some, some wisdom. He wanted to say to them, Hey, man, I'm about to go, and I just need you to know kind of, I'll refer to it this way, I kind of want you to have the short course. I, I want you to know the basics, and I just want to remind you of that. We've been together now for several years, and I'm about to leave, and so I want to make sure you get it. And so in Matthew chapter 25, he has sat them down and he begins to talk in parables, these stories of learning, these ways to better understand. And he tells them how it's going to end and where they ought to be and how they ought to be. And then in verse 31 of chapter 25, Jesus gets real serious. And he starts talking about judgment. And this is what he has to say. It's very powerful and very relevant to our selfie-less series. Here's what he says. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne of glory. So this is the end times. We, we actually just profess this in the Apostles' Creed. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Right? That's what we meant when we said that. That's what this is. Okay? So, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His angels with Him, they will sit on His throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Pay attention. Spoiler alert. You don't want to be a goat. Okay? And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats at his left hand. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's pretty cool, wouldn't you say? Inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This isn't any common everyday kind of deal. It's not a, it's sort of a, a lackluster conversation. This is serious stuff. And it's about God's work called the kingdom. And then Jesus basically lays it out, just plain and simple. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him. And the righteous answer Jesus as only the righteous would do. That is to say, people who are in right relationship with God, who understand whose role they are and whose they are, they answer quite humbly. Because people who are in a good relationship with Jesus know He's one and they're two, right? And so they respond this way in verse 37. Lord, uh, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you some to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer, truly I tell you, just as you did it 
to one of the least of these who were members of my family. He did it to me. This is Jesus talking. When you clothed them or fed them or gave them drink or visited them or cared for them or welcomed them, you did it to me. And if you're familiar with the rest of the story, you know, of course, his conversation about the goats was they didn't feed or clothe or welcome or care. And they didn't sit on the right and they didn't get a good outcome. It wasn't a good deal for the folks on the left. Isn't it funny how when judgment is talked about in Scripture and how where we profess it in our own creed on a regular basis, we get a little afraid when we actually want to talk about it now, right? Because judgment is one of those deals that we kind of know is possible and we know it's a part of the faith and we understand that it's all out there. But, but most of us good Methodists, we just like to talk about love <laughs> and grace and mercy, all of which, of course, are wonderful things. But here's our reality, friends. Jesus will come again, and He will come to judge both the living and the dead. And there's good news and bad news about all of that, and your notes will indicate that. Here's the bad news. Judgment's coming. Hello. It's part of life. It's part of faith. It's part of death. It's a part of who we are as followers of Jesus. Judgment is is coming. That's the bad news. But that bad news, like all uh, things in the gospel, actually has a great bit of good news to it. And the good news is, quite literally, that we get the opportunity to be judged well. We get the opportunity to be judged ri wisely. We get the opportunity to live into, in an appropriate and good and positive way, that judgment. Because here's the deal about judgment. Judgment is not based on belief. And here, here's what I mean by that before we kind of get all disturbed. Judgment is held for those who profess faith in Jesus. That's in part what Jesus is pointing out here. It's for those of us who say, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you suffered and died for my sins. I believe you uh, gave me everlasting life. I believe you offered that to everybody. Uh, that's my belief. Uh, judgment is not held for those who don't profess that. It's held for those of us who do profess that. But secondly, here's what I mean. Uh, it does not matter what I believe about baptism with regard to judgment. It doesn't matter what I believe about God's Word. That is to say, do I need unleavened bread or leavened bread? Do I need grape juice or wine? Uh, Jesus isn't wrapped up in that kind of crud. Nor is judgment wrapped up in that kind of crud. Judgment, rather, is on what I do. That is to say, how I respond to what Jesus has already done for me. Because here's the deal, y'all. I'm not talking what has been commonly known as works righteousness. That is to say that we can earn our salvation, that we can earn and do enough good things that we can find a right relationship with Jesus. That's not what I mean here. Because here's the gift that we know about salvation, which is different from judgment. Salvation and judgment are two different things. Salvation, we're told, both by Jesus and by the Apostle Paul, is a free gift by grace, right? It's free. All I've got to do is believe. I've got to believe that Jesus suffered and died on that cross for my sins, for the sins of the world, that He was raised from the dead to everlasting life, and that I get that too, right? That we, as His followers who've claimed that, we get that. Salvation is free. It is a blessed gift of God. It is the reality that God loves us enough, even as we are, to receive us, to accept us, to care for us, and to welcome us into the kingdom. That is free. But judgment is by how we respond to that gift. How do we respond to that gift? What do we do with it? What do we do about it? What does it all entail? How does it work? Much like a parent who would say to a child, I affirm you and I love you and I care for you, that's a form of judgment. And likewise, uh, what you just did is not helpful and I'm disappointed in you. That's judgment. God looks out of all of God's creation for those of us who've accepted the free gift of salvation found in Jesus and says to us, what have you done about that? What have you done with that? And that's where judgment 
comes. You see, Jesus' analogy here is very profound about clothing and feeding and welcoming and caring that in that is found Jesus, right? That's what he said. But this isn't the only place Jesus talks about this. We tend to relegate it right here to Matthew chapter 25, but there are actually several other places. Not only Christ talks about it, but Paul and others talk about it. So walk with me back a couple of chapters in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. Jesus is talking to the elders of the Jewish faith. And he's saying to them in Matthew chapter 21, Look, I told you, you're going to lose out on the kingdom that God prepared for you. And God's going to hand it over to those people who have done what God desires for the kingdom. There's that do thing. There's that done, that, that action thing. That the kingdom that God intended from the very foundations of the earth, remember? That it's going to be handed over to those who do what Christ intended. In John's Gospel, in the fifth chapter, Jesus likewise is talking to the disciples. And in the fifth chapter, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And in the talking of the resurrection of the dead, he quite literally says, those who have done good will rise to life forever. And those who have done evil will be judged guilty. You see, judgment is for the living and the dead. And it's all about the response to the free gift of God's grace. Paul, who laid the foundation for us in many of his letters, not the least of which was Ephesians chapter 2, where he said we are saved by grace through faith, is also the same one who in Romans chapter 2 would say that it, you likewise will give eternal life to those who keep on doing good as a response to the gift of salvation. The very last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Beautiful book, many of us get scared by it, but a powerful book about hope and about the richness of God's love. And in part, at the very end of the book of Revelation in chapter 20, there were the reference to the book of life, that book we all want our name in, right? In that book of life, remember, we are judged by what we've done. And that's how our name gets there. Not because we earned our salvation but because we responded to that gift of salvation by living God's love and service in the world that's Christ's calling for us now it's hard sometimes right it's hard because of that gap I mentioned at the beginning that gap that says we value this we value service we value giving to other people but our time and our lives are constricted and we we're not quite sure how we're going to bridge the gap well Jesus I think offers us uh, two really good motivators here in Matthew chapter 25 that I, I, I know they motivate me and I can only hope uh, they might motivate you and that is the first which is this so these acts of service we're talking about so service starts in the heart but then it, we must act from the heart take note of what Jesus says about these acts in Matthew 25 he says these acts of service are two and four Jesus they're two and for Jesus they're, they're not for us they're not really even for the person receiving the benefit but they're for Jesus remember that's what he said in verse 40 remember when you did this to the least of these my brothers and sisters and my family you did it to me I wonder what motivation might look like then if in the stranger and in the prisoner and in the hungry and in the thirsty and in the uh, naked that we might see the face of Jesus rather than every other image that comes to mind because there's all kinds of images that come to our mind about strangers and prisoners and hungry people and thirsty people and, sh and naked people I mean there's all kinds of images that come to mind but I wonder if what we really believed and saw was the face of Christ every time we went to serve somebody man I might want to do that, right? I, I might want to help my Lord. I might want to help Jesus in others. That's pretty motivating, right? And if that's not enough, then Jesus gives us a second motivator that I think is equally helpful in claiming that we've got to act, we've got to do something about this challenge. And that is this, that when we do these acts, Jesus says we get the blessed gift of inheriting the kingdom. 
Now, inheriting the kingdom uh, may not make a lot of sense to us, but remember, the kingdom was prepared for us from the foundation of the earth. That's what Jesus said. And we pray for that kingdom, actually, in the Lord's Prayer. When we pray it, you just prayed it. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so part of God's goal from the very beginning of creation is that we would be a part of the building of God's kingdom, that we would be able to inherit that and that we would be able to make it possible for others to inherit it as well by the way in which we radically love and serve for the cause of Christ wherever and however. You see, friends, we cannot outsource love and service, justice. And we can't outsource it. It's a part of who we are. And the good news here about judgment is that we can be judged well. We can be judged wisely. We can be judged rightly if we'll simply respond to the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. That, in many parts, is what No Selfie Saturday is all about. You've got these inserts. And, and here's what we know, right? No Selfie Saturday is just a day. It's just a day. And yet it's a powerful way to help demonstrate and be judged well, right? And, and so you've got all these different kinds of um, opportunities, some of which may take you one or two hours on Saturday uh, the 21st. Uh, one or two might take you seven, eight, even nine hours. It just depends on the particular project. Some of them don't even happen on the Saturday. They happen before or after the Saturday. It, it really just depends. So there are all kinds of opportunities. But the point is, and the point from the very beginning of No Selfie Saturday three years ago was, that this would not be an end in itself, that it would not be the only means by which we serve others and love people radically, but rather it would be a springboard. It would be a springboard for us to discover, hey, I, I know my time is constricted and I know I want to do the right thing, but I don't know where or how or why or what. But maybe there's one project on No Selfie Saturday. Maybe there's one opportunity that captivates me or maybe there's one thing that I could do and maybe that's the thing I ought to do and maybe that would be the thing I could start doing on a regular basis, whether daily, weekly, monthly, or, or yearly, whatever it is, what would it be like if I actually did what it is Christ calls me to do? Y'all, the list is pretty basic, and yet it's foundational to who we are. I want to encourage us, if we haven't already, to sign up, to commit to an opportunity, to commit to the possibility that God is with us. The cards do the same. They are just a tangible way to say, thank you for doing God's work. Thank you for helping us see the face of Jesus on a regular basis. Right? I know we can't all do everything. And I know um, our time is limited because it is a reality. But I wonder if we can't just do something whatever it is. Uh, one of the great examples we have from a few weeks ago was uh, our early response, our emergency response team. Seven of our congregation went down to Victoria, Texas, and they were able to go uh, both put on the face of Jesus and see the face of Jesus in the faces of those whom they helped. Of those who went, Bob Baylor was one, and Bob wanted to share with you just a quick word about what it meant for him and how it is that he encountered this powerful gift. So I wonder if you might watch and hear what Bob has to say. Hi, my name is Bob Baylor, and I participated in the Victoria trip where we went down and responded to the results of the uh, Hurricane Harvey. You know, you've heard uh, people talking about uh, walking on water. We have to get out of the boat first. I think that's one of the key factors that we kind of ignore. The fact that you have to be committed. You have to make a decision early on so that when there is a need, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a need for um, a response to a disaster. It can be a response to anything that needs 
individuals responding in a Christian manner to a person that uh, has a need. But once we got there, what was really surprising, and there you see the uh, effect, if you will, of other Christians that are getting the message, and getting the message individually. And that's where you really see a connection with, with Jesus in this uh, situation. So if you're looking for a connection, a connection with a spiritual involvement, if you are looking for uh, hearing the voice of God, participate in some of these activities, meet some of these people. That's the adventure. Uh, life is a journey, it's not just a destination, it's the journey and it's the people and the events that you participate in along this journey. So I think it's really important that all of us understand that it's a response and that's one of our duties. Birds fly, fish swim, and it's our job to respond. Don't you love that analogy? Birds fly, fish swim. What he didn't say is, Christians serve. That's what, that's what Christ laid out for us. I don't know about you, but my hope and prayer for my own life, and certainly for all of us, is that when we come to the end of our days, we might hear those powerful words of Jesus that simply say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. That would make life a great joy and it would present the great possibilities that we've done what Christ called us to and that we could be judged well because of our response to the free gift of God's love. May it be so for next Saturday, for next week, and for next year that we might take up that call on a regular basis to be judged well by Jesus. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you for the gift of your love and for the possibilities we have to serve in your name. Help us, Lord, each and every day to take up that challenge and that call and really that wonderful possibility that we could indeed be your faithful servant and find your judgment well because of the ways in which we responded to your love first. God, that's a great prayer of all of ours. I pray we step up these days and the next that we might indeed be your faithful servants. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who indeed gave his all in the service of all, we pray. Amen.